Hello, this is David Mandel. I'm your instructor. And um, I'm experimenting with uh, video recording. I haven't re recorded any videos in a long time. I've recorded, oh, for one class I recorded a hundred and some videos. But that's been a couple years ago. I've upgraded my systems and I've got to totally and completely change the system I'm using. So this is an experiment to see if the new system is working. Um, <clears throat> so let me tell you a little bit about myself. I have a BS in mathematics from Portland State University and a master's degree from the University of Montana. And I've gone on after that <clears throat> spent time studying applied mathematics at uh, Oregon State, or I'm sorry, well, yes, at Washington State University and at Oregon State University. My training in school was pretty much in very pure mathematics. The mathematics that is close to philosophy, foundations of mathematics, and Actually, I studied a lot of philosophy, and I also studied quite a bit of physics. Okay, not entirely compatible. Well, I guess they're compatible. Um, but my mathematical background was pure mathematics, so uh, after a while I went back and studied some applied mathematics because I wanted to get a job, or wanted to eat. Um, my first professional job was as a Peace Corps volunteer in Malaysia way back in the 1970s. Um, in fact, Malaysia's in Southeast Asia, not too far from uh, Cambodia and Vietnam and Thailand and uh, Laos and other places that had fighting going on in, at that time. So. Um, it, it was a hot area. Malaysia was quite peaceful, but uh, we were aware that there was fighting in Southeast Asia. In fact, uh, South Vietnam fell while I was in, uh, in Malaysia. And a lot of people were putting together, you know, putting money aside for the escape. And, um, but it was a great place to work. And it's been a great country. Um, it's, um, uh, I taught at a, see if I can find it, at a school called University of Putania in Malaysia. It has since been renamed uh, University Putra, Malaysia. This is an awful looking web page, but, um, but it's a cool university. It's a well-known university at this point in time. It was young. Well, it was old, but it was a small university that had just been nationalized uh, when I was there and um, it had been a private university. It was fairly a, a university, Pertanian means agricultural university, so it, it did have pure programs but it had a lot of applied programs. It was sort of like an Oregon State University, only much smaller. We had forestry, we had agriculture, we had a big teacher training program for science education. I was very much a part of that. And I worked a lot with the agriculture students as well. Um, uh, it was a lot of fun. Um, I, someday I hope to uh, um, I, I go back again. I went back once. Um, actually, I think there's a wiki page on the university. It's uh, well, that's cool, and it even says someplace that it used uh, that it used to be University Patania in Malaysia. They renamed it University Putra Malaysia so they could keep the same UPM because it's often known as UPM. Uh, so they have the same initials, the same web page, except that was so long ago we didn't have a web page. <laughs> that was um, <laughs> that was when the internet was just first being developed. <laughs> And it certainly wasn't out of the U.S. or out of um, the NATO alliance by then. Okay. Um, after that, I went to Oregon State University and um, as, as a research technician, 
where I did programming and systems administration with the um, Oregon State University College of Oceanography. Uh, I worked there for quite some time. Actually, even in recent years, I've gone back and did cons some consulting with the um, with the uh, climate research people, the so-called PRISM group, in uh, oh maybe five years ago now. I'm currently retired. I do a little, quite a bit of farming and uh, agricultural type stuff. Um, and I still do a little bit of computing. And I also worked with the, as a contractor with US Bureau of Land Management doing geographic information systems. I was chief engineer for the contractor on a, uh, um, for a system where we built um, maps for the Bureau of Land Management, the US Forest Service, and a number of other government agencies, but largely the Bureau of Land Management, uh, and largely in the Pacific Northwest, although I think we had some people in New Mexico, um, certainly Idaho, and we had people across Oregon. Um, and um, that was a pretty good sized system. That was um, a major statewide network our region-wide network that uh, for a time I oversaw and then I was chief engineer on the project. We had somewhere between I think the peak number of people we had was about 150. Uh, usually it was more like 70 people and that lasted for years and years. I was there for maybe 13 years. Um, uh, that's Bureau of Land Management stuff. I've always been interested in open source software since well before there were words like a free so uh, open source software or even free software. Uh, from my early, as an academic, from my earliest days, I did open source software. I think in the early days we called it public domain because we didn't have any other words for it. And then around 1980. Uh, mid 1980s it became free software and today we most of us call it open source software uh, except for a few people who still prefer the name free software. Um, among other things I helped found a group called the Portland Linux Unix group. It was probably the first group in Oregon uh, or truly open source group in Oregon um, in fact, I know it was. Today we have hundreds of open source groups in Oregon, but this was the grandfather of them all. Um, we were large. We were pretty prominent at the time. Today we're a much smaller group, but we still um, still have some influence and they are historically very important. And um, I invite you to come to one of our meetings. They're all free. Um, we tend to have beer afterwards. Um, our general meeting is at Portland State University the first Thursday of the month. And we're a fundamentally a Linux or a Unix group or open source. I mean, we'll do open source on Windows. It doesn't much matter. Um, it's our concern is open source software. And uh, I'm less active than I used to be. I headed the group for maybe 20 years. Uh, and uh, we are over 20 years old. If you want a um, to know more about what's happening in Portland, because Oregon is a real center for open source software. Oregon, um, Austin, Texas, maybe the Massachusetts area around uh, MIT, um, and and of course there's so much of everything around. Um, the Silicon Valley, that there's a lot of open source there too. Well, there's open source every place. And, and of course, there's open source in certain countries, Germany, England, um, Australia, well, the English speaking countries, Australia, um, and Malaysia. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of countries into open source. Huh? And, uh, 
it's a big up and coming area. Okay, yeah, but if you want to know what's happening locally in Oregon, the place to go is a website called Caligator.org. It's really an event calendar for the Portland area, but it was written by open source people for open source people. So it tends to be biased towards open source events. It's free for anyone to use. Um, <coughs> both posting things and uh, attending, or, you know, using it. Um, it's um, it is a piece of open source software written by open source software people. Most of the groups on it are open source, but certainly not all of them. And most of them, you know, are most of the events are free to go to or, or you know, free to go, but you're encouraged to buy a meal or something of that type. And you can see here that there are, uh, what, <laughs> several dozen, <laughs> that's, uh, well, I can't count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Uh, I don't know. Fifteen events today. Um, you could spend your life going to open, uh, going to events in the Portland area. Some of them are cool. This is a Python group, um, or maybe it's Python ladies. But um, anyway, it, it's a Python group. This is BSD Pizza. BSD is another set of operating systems that are open source other than Linux. And the BSD people and the Linux people most of the time are quite good friends. Here is PDX Hackerspace. Um, and you'll see hundreds of these groups. Obviously, I'm here's one handcrafted entrepreneurs. I don't know what that is. Here's a Java group. Anyway, anything you want to learn. These are good groups to go to. And later on in some other video, I'll talk about why they're good groups to go to. Actually, I'll try to mention it if I do a video on ethics, because um, because your book mentions various groups and it ignores local groups. Um, OK, let's get up my picture here so you can see me. Um, <coughs> That's pretty much everything about myself. I will say one or two things about 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 me, about my approach to life, and things of that type. Um, first thing, I want to see what time it is here. OK. I, I, <clears throat> I'll say a couple things yet. Um, I tend to be kind of inclined towards being a generalist, not a specialist. I am not, I can kind of do a little bit of secu computer security. I mean, if you're a, if you're a systems administrator, you've got to do computer security. But I'm not a security specialist. I'm um, I, yes, I do administrate computer systems. I've administrated large networks. I don't know if I'm really a computer administrator in the sense, or a systems administrator, in the sense that I all do also do software development. My bias in software development is towards um, towards uh, application software. I'm a mathematician. I did doing the scientific type software, computer mapping, things like that. But I've done I've done um, system software. I've done business software. Um, you know, I, I, I do what people need. And, um, and I encourage that attitude. I guess I'm kind of a mathematician, computer, uh, philosopher. I, I'm not sure. But I also like to farm. Um, and, you know, you've got to farm in a philosophically pleasing way. So farming is a lot of farming is involved, my farming at least, is involved in uh, certainly with um, with um, ph philosophical thoughts. I'm, I'm somewhat of a follower of the great, um, I guess, philosopher, uh, educator, uh, Rudolf Steiner, who was a uh, Austrian 
intellectual in maybe the 1920s, 1930, 19, uh, yeah, 1920. Oh, he died in the 1920s, so. And he was kind of a contemporary of people like Sigmund Freud, and of course being, Aust you know, those were all good Austrian guys, or uh, uh, Hayek, the, the uh, economist. Um, and I think, I dis I think there is too much tendency in modern education to encourage people to specialize and make everybody a specialist. And I really discourage that with your careers. I think you are more valuable and will do better if you try. You want to be a generalist, but you want to be a generalist who knows something. So. Too, being too narrow and too specialized, having a lot of depth in too specialized an area will, is not good. Being so general you know nothing about anything <laughs> is also not good. You want to be in between. You want some substance, but you want to be willing to um, explore new areas, take on new areas, and try to take your something you know from one specialty and apply it to another specialty. That's what the world is short of and that's what the world will pay money for. So if you're new to computing and you have this dream that you want to be a computer guy, you probably won't be able to compete with a lot of the computer guys out there because there's a lot of computer guys out there. But if you have a background in, in um, homological algebra, I don't know, um, and you become a computer guy, sort of, or girl, uh, gal, and you know homological algebra, and you blend the two together, you'll get every job in the world that needs a homological com algebraic computer person. Okay, there may only be 20 jobs for those people, but there's only one person <laughs> that knows that. So I, you know, I really encourage people, you find a niche and not, and, and, and your niche is usually something you make up yourself. And it's, it's, it's a cross between several areas. In fact, I will say, you know, of some of our great um, intellectuals, look at, um, well, Rudolf Steiner. Rudolf Steiner, he started the War Waldorf schools. He was famous for his work in education. He started biodynamic uh, farming. He was famous for his work in agriculture. I think he thought of himself as a psychologist. Um, you know, he didn't care. Oh, he did religious studies. He, uh, he blended it all. Um, there's something called the Hardy Weinberg law in 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 um, in um, genetics, and uh, it's supposed to be a really famous law in genetics. The interesting thing is is Hardy was not a geneticist. Hardy was a great mathematician. Weinberg was not a geneticist. He was a physician, and they were both reading these papers and uh, in genetics, and both got to thinking, no, that's obviously wrong. This is the way you do it. And that's what they come up with the Hardy-Weinberg law. Came from non-geneticists. Uh, the father of genetics, of course, was um, Gregor Mendel, who was a uh, Austrian monk. Um, and we think of him as this, I, I, in school, of, I was always taught he was this little kindly out of backcountry woods Austrian monk. That's not quite true. He was a famous, well-known physicist who did his PhD under some of the finest physicists at the University of Berlin, or uh, I'm sorry, Vienna. And and that was back when Austria was pre, -Aust you know, it was the uh, the ruler of the Austrian Hungarian Empire. So, and and he was a monk too. And, and so he went 
back to being a monk and did a lot of work in, in physics. Wrote a lot of papers in um, mostly in atmospheric sciences. Was founder of the Austrian uh, Meteorological Society. Uh, as I understand, he was a well-known physicist. But he, got, he liked to grow beans and peas and odd things. I mean, he was a monk, so he had to be a gardener. So, you know, he gardened. Well, he liked to garden. And he got this idea that there was something mathematical, genetical going on with the genes in his garden. And he came up with the fundamental laws of genetics uh, after 10 years of hard work on this. And um, they were published in this obscure little journal. And where I was always told this is because he was this backwoods country, uh, a monk. I wasn't the truth at all. It's because he was trying. He was a physicist trying to get published in a um, in uh, the biological sciences. Had he, had, you know, uh, and it's hard to get published out of your field. <laughs> so he got published in out of the way places. But uh, um, well, anyway, neither here nor there. Um, I think that's. Um, more than enough introduction because this is drug on for several minutes here. So I will uh, end this. And um, besides, I've got a class that I've got to get to. So um, I will end this now. Bye bye.